Hey guys, welcome to episode 10 of A Different Perspective. When we started this whole thing, we, we wanted to learn and grow, and we mainly did this so we could get better at talking on camera and, and starting to teach. And so for a 10th episode, because this is a special one, we really wanted to bring somebody on that you guys can learn from and somebody that in, actually inspired both of us to start this channel really from what he's been doing. So we have a very special guest for you and we're really excited about this episode. All right, so the guest that we have today is someone you've probably heard of. If you haven't, you might be living under a rock or maybe you haven't heard of him because uh, you are someone who's just joined the channel recently and are here for photography. But we are bringing in none other than EJ Hasenfratz. EJ is an amazing 3D artist, a designer and animator. He's also a teacher and he's a certified instructor for Maxon. He uses Cinema 4D as his primary go-to 3D animation and design software. And he also recently started teaching full-time for School of Motion. Um, and that's how I got to know him. And also EJ is Kyle's brother, if you didn't know. That is who we have on today. And I think you're really gonna love it and learn a lot from his experience. All right, so EJ, everyone that's watching this probably already knows who you are and a little bit about you, but if you can go through a brief backstory, you know, how you got started on your creative journey and where you are now with teaching 3D. Yeah, Kyle, bro. What's up? Uh, I think we have a lot of the same stories, like our dad and our uncles. They were uh, in not motion design, but graphic design. And I think just art was always around us. We used to go to the newsrooms and see what dad was doing. And like we go to New York City and hang out at ABC in Manhattan. And that was really cool for me. I think just that kind of got me on my journey into inter getting interested in art and at the time it was just like drawing Ninja Turtles and Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that and you know I was just like I know I like to do this thing but I have no idea like I was just like I'm gonna go to school for graphic design and work at a news station just like my dad and my uncle and that was what I was gonna do like I had no idea what motion design was I, I think when I graduated it was 2004 and that's when like it started just becoming a thing. And in college, I just did photography with film. You go into the developing room and you drop the film on the floor and it just screws everything up and did like a little bit of Photoshop, a little bit of Illustrator, but like I didn't know how to animate or anything at all. I did a little bit of 3D, uh, made like a, like a Gundam robot. It's funny because when I did 3D in college, I was like, this is just too much over my head. Like this isn't interesting to me at all, which is really funny. Yeah, I think I just, you know, when I went to school and I graduated, I got an internship to work for my dad. <laughs> he was the art director and I was the intern. And there, like I got to meet like some of the awesome talented people that worked there, like Steve Benton King, John Desenzi, and they just like, John was the 3D whiz and Steve King was like the After Effects whiz. So like I've never touched After Effects before and I just like sat next to him and like what John was doing in 3D was just like, I'm never gonna be able to do that in my life. So I'm just gonna focus on After Effects. Just kind of sat next to him and really started getting a hang of what After Effects did and you know, being an intern and part-time employee there, like had the opportunity to fail a lot, which was nice because, you know, I didn't get that opportunity to fail in that aspect in college, you know, learning After Effects. And, you know, if, if it wasn't for an internship, I don't think a real employer would have had the patience with me to like learn all this new software and just sit there and like, I'd read like Mark Christensen books and, and all that stuff and just go, you know, step by step with some of these After Effects, uh, because there's no tutorials, you know, it's all books. So I'm like reading along, had the DVD of the project files and I'm like going through it. Uh, but yeah, since, you know, I got into news and then had to end up leaving Pittsburgh and NBC where I was working uh, for my dad, ended up getting like my first full-time job in, uh, in graphic design at the PBS station in Washington, DC. And uh, like, again, had opportunity to play around and learn After Effects and switched over to ABC in DC and 
there I just like, there was a guy that was uh, playing around with Cinema 4D and that was awesome. And he introduced me to this guy called Grayscale Gorilla and like I got into that and he ended up leaving and I ended up taking over for that role there, the senior motion design role there. Just started learning as much as I could because it was so interesting and new to me. And, you know, I always was like, I don't want to keep doing the same thing of like, here's an over the shoulder, someone got murdered. Let's keep, do, let's angle the gun this way. And, you know, uh, police uh, tape and da da da. Like I wanted to go beyond that. So like any place I could, I was trying to push my abilities and like try to pitch like, hey, like here's these cool things I'm seeing Troika doing and you know, LA and they did a lot of news uh, packages and stuff like that. And then it was just, you know, Grayscale Gorilla. And it's funny because just a couple days ago, Nick from Grayscale Gorilla said it's been 10 years since his first uh, tutorial, I think it was. 10 or 12, I can't remember, but I remember like following him and learning about him. And he was a huge influence on me getting into 3D, learning Cinema 4D, and then also like being active in the community and trying to teach as well. Yeah, that's awesome. You mentioned like um, having a lot of opportunities to fail. And I'd imagine that's the, the fastest way to grow. It actually leads well into the next question we have, which is, what made you decide to start pursuing teaching and tutorials? And when you started, did, you know, speaking to camera and all that come naturally to you? Or did you have to like work through a lot of stressful, um, like nerves doing that? Or what was that journey like basically? Yeah, so that I totally fell butt backwards into that. So going back to the Grayscale Gorilla and like just through the lens of what he was doing, he really shined a spotlight on like the community they had there in Chicago. And I remember like everyone's like, oh, I want to move to Chicago. That scene there, the motion design scene looks so cool and blah, blah, blah. And everyone's really cool. So like through Twitter and stuff like that, I would start following Chicago motion designers and uh, all that good stuff. And like started seeing about how, how there's all these meetups and like, man, these people got to hang out with all these other nerds that, you know, I can only interact with on Twitter and they're doing this in person or going to breweries and stuff. So I was like, you know, I should see, you know, at the time I was the only one that knew Cinema 4D where I worked at. So I was kind of like in my own little bubble. And I did know another guy who worked at a studio in DC, uh, Dave Glanz, and he did a lot of work for Discovery Channel and stuff like that. But he was like literally on the only other dude that like, knew who Grayscale Gorilla was, like was on Twitter, was active in like the motion design social uh, bubble. And so I was just searching to see like, all right, are there any graphic design meetups or anything in DC? And I think it was like through meetup.com or something like that, but I just searched and there was this animators meetup and it was for all kinds of animation, like traditional cell animation, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so I ended up, like following them, went to one and like met the guy who was running it all, just started chatting with them and stuff like that. And he's like, oh yeah, I think we're, cause I was mentioning like, oh yeah, I do Cinema 4D, blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, I'm gonna, I think we're gonna have like a Maxon sponsored meetup here in a few months. Like, would you be interested in presenting? And I'd be like, I was like, I don't know, but just let me know if it's happening or not. And so like a couple months later, he hits me up and is like, hey, we're doing this meetup. Do you know of, you know, I know you know Cinema 4D, do you want to present? And then do you know anyone else who uses Cinema 4D who can present? So I was like, Shh. I was like, sure, I'll do it. But I talked to my buddy Dave and I was like, do you want to do this too? Cause I was like, I don't think I want to do this if it's just me. So if we do this together, like maybe it'll be okay and less nerve wracking. So he was like, sure, okay. And I think it was probably the first time either of us spoke in front of an audience of people. And we had like a couple people from our like art department there at ABC. And so that was kind of fun, but like it was like 50 other people that had no idea who they were. I had some work that I did for the Washington Capitals a hockey team in town. And I was like really proud about doing that because that was like my freelance side hustle kind of thing. and really proud of the work I did for that and the techniques that I came up with. So I was like, okay, I think I feel confident to do this. And like, just wait, we had like a 20 minute presentation and it was just like, okay, so we're gonna move this thing over here. Um, 
and uh, like I think it's online still somewhere, and it's pr I never want to see it again. But it was probably terrible. And uh, then my buddy Dave went on after me. You know, after it was done, I was like, man, that was rough. Like I was so nervous. Like my heart was still pounding at the time. And but I, we had some people come up to us saying like, oh, that was really cool. Like thanks for doing that. And I was like, you serious? Like I thought I bombed. They're like no, you did fine. I was like okay. And then you watch yourself back, like I did watch that video that recorded back and like actually it wasn't as like all the awkward pauses, like in your head in the moment, they feel like they're 30 minutes long, but in reality it was like a second. And it's like, oh, I thought I screwed up way worse than I did. So that's always a thing that definitely helped me get over the fear of doing it is like whatever you think, however bad you think you did in your head, it's not as bad as you think you did. Then I, f I didn't know that they were recording these things. I thought it was just for maybe like, oh, just throwing online or something like that. What they're actually doing was Maxon sponsored the thing and the stipulation was like, hey, we're gonna pay for pizza and soda, da da da, you know, sponsor the space. Uh, but you just gotta send us the videos of the presenters that they can like, I guess, use or do whatever they want with. And so I didn't know that. Um, but then like a couple weeks later, someone from Maxon, Matthias, uh, who is amazing, Matthias Omatola, uh, he's like the uh, community manager over at Maxon, and I think is one of the main reason, him and Paul, the CEO over there, uh, like the main reason why this community is so amazing. And he just was like, hey, I saw you and Dave's uh, presentations from that DC meetup. Do you wanna present with us at NAB in Vegas? And I was like, wait are you sure you're talking about our videos because i don't think we did i don't think we're vegas ready yet uh but he's like no you guys did awesome we'd love to have you guys so i like like called dave i was like did you get this call too he's like yeah and i was like w are we gonna do this like and he's like he's like if you do it i'll do it and i'm like all right screw it whatever we'll do this but then i like started learning about the other presenters and like at least dave has worked for discovery channel like that's big but i was like local news station dude and then there's guys from like man versus machine and like buck and the mill and it's like who the hell am i <laughs> so that really made me super like you know, imposter syndrome, like who the hell am I? Like literally who the hell am I compared to like all this other talent? So what I ended up doing was like, I definitely need to get better. Cause I like, I would rewatch my presentation. I'm like, this is not Vegas quality. <laughs> like my presenting skills are not good. Uh, like I feel I was like talking flat, like, and I still have tutorials on my website that are super old and you can watch them and listen to them. And it's crazy how like because I'm like critiquing myself I was like you sound so dull like what is your problem <laughs> like act like you're having some fun so I ended up just recording myself doing my presentation uh and just doing it on my own end I wasn't posting it anywhere just to get the timing down and just to like not f up constantly so I had to like I was going through it to memorize the stuff and I was like you know what there was a technique that I shared in my one video that uh Joran from the Pixel Lab was like, hey, that's a really cool technique. Do you mind if I like share it on the Pixel Lab site? And he's like, only if that's okay with you, like I'll give you credit, da da da. And I was like, you know what, F it. Like I've been saying that I've been gonna do a tutorial for the longest time and I'm always talking with Joran because Joran was like, I considered him really good at tutorials and he was new on the scene and he wasn't like, you know, as, as popular or as like known as uh, Grayscale Gorilla, but he was like really, you know, doing some awesome stuff. So I really looked up to what he did, he was doing and he would always encourage me to do videos. So I was like, you know what, Jorn, like screw it. I'm gonna record the tutorial of that technique. Like, so don't worry about it. Like I'll do it. Like this will force me to actually post something online. So I did the technique, it's still on, like I, I should actually see what date that was so I can do my like 10 year, whatever, whenever it happens. But that was my first tutorial of just like, okay, I'm gonna, I was practicing my presentation. I'm gonna practice this tutorial. I'm gonna post it online and I'm going to open myself up to all this criticism, which is just all that's what's going through your head. And it's like, I hope someone likes this. I hope someone thinks this is as cool of a technique as Joran said it was. 
so much so that he wanted to do a video on it. So like that kind of gave me the confidence of like, okay, if Joran think this is good, like hopefully someone else will. And so I released it and I don't really remember, like I think I got like some comments from my friends that I knew like in the Twitter sphere at the time, like Chicago motion designers, some people from LA that I knew. And I was like, oh, cool. Like that wasn't a complete disaster. I didn't have like YouTube con, or actually I think it was on Vimeo. So I didn't even, I think that was a big thing and I didn't have to like worry about nasty YouTube comments at the time. Cause I just posted on Vimeo and that's like, at the time Vimeo was actually really cool. It was like a more motion designery photography video site. Uh, I don't know what it's turned into now, but I know people aren't really using it as much anymore, but like that kind of gave me a little bit more confidence of like, okay, well, maybe I'll release another one before I have to go to Vegas. So like I have, like I feel more confident in my speaking and I'm practicing more. And just, and I think even when you're doing any kind of personal work whatsoever, that actual act of posting the thing, making it good enough for people to look at and like tear down or compliment or like just critique it, like that is terrifying, but also motivating to, you know, make sure it's the best it can be. And to also like, you're not gonna learn if you don't share your work. And there's there's a book that Kyle and I both have called Share Your Work by Austin Kleon. And I think it's great because it's all about like what you learn by going through that whole process of making and then sh like showing it to the world and dealing with the consequences, you know, good or bad and, you know, just learning from it. So. Yeah, that was, we did the NAB Vegas thing and I felt like I was way over my head and uh, I, I got really good response. And so it was always this thing where it's like, I didn't really get, I didn't post tutorials to get into it, but it was for the purpose of like, I needed to get ready for this presentation in Vegas. But then the side effect was I found out that like, I guess I knew things that people didn't know and people enjoyed it. And they would say that I could explain things in a way that was, you know, like talked on a normal level. And I didn't like speak above people technically, technical wise and stuff like that. So, and that's something like I didn't know that I could do. Like, I'm not very good at being introspective at all of like, EJ, you're great at this, you know? And it's like, no, I'm just doing this and it seems like people like it. I don't know why, <laughs> like, I don't think I'm that great, but you know, it's just this thing where it's like, if people are gonna say that it's helpful, like that means a lot to me that someone took the time to watch the video and then took the time to comment on it. And just that feeling of knowing that you help someone else when like people like Grayscale Gorilla and you know, Aaron Rabinowitz and like all those people that, you know, Andrew Kramer, all those people that were really pioneering the like online learning video tutorial space. Like if I could give back the way they could to me, like I was always in that mindset of like, if I have, like I will give away everything that I know if it can help someone out there. So it's just this thing where it was this, cycle of you know hey i love your videos like keep them coming i'm like are you sure like okay you asked for it and so and it just became a thing to where i just love that interaction with the community and you know when i was at abc i was in an edit booth just by myself and i was the only one that was like really into 3d and cinema 4d and wanting to learn everything about it so social media was my only outlet to connect with other like-minded people that were as stoked on learning as much as I was. And I think making the tutorials, going to NAB, those were the those were the only opportunities that I could like plug in into that world time and time again. So I think that just led me to, I mean, even to this day, I'm in my home office. Like I've been uh, working from home in my home office, freelancing for uh, phew, like six years now, I think. So it's just this thing where it's like, in DC, I really didn't know that many other designers. I moved to Denver, there's a lot more here, but that just kind of set my own, my whole path of like, I want to teach, I want to interact with people because I learn a lot just teaching and interacting with other people. And now it's crazy because I'm seeing people that are super talented that are also teaching and sharing what they know. And I think it's great. Like, it's great to have all these voices sharing all their stuff because I feel like after doing a hundred and almost 150 tutorials, I'm like, my brain is just like, I got nothing left to give. <laughs> someone, someone teach me something though.
That's awesome. I didn't even know some of that stuff on how you got started with Maxon and everything too. So at what point during that journey did you figure out that you wanted to, you know, stop working for TV stations and just do freelance? And what was that transition like? Yeah, I think it was one of the main reasons was that like you just when you're at a news station, you just kind of hit a wall and like you could do all these things, but like news, local news, they don't need all that stuff. Um, and actually, you know, when I was there, it's it's very much a, a product of the times because like I had a really awesome creative director at ABC and he really pushed me and he would always like see the thing. Like I would follow a Grayscale Gorilla tutorial and I'd be like, hey, Stan, look at this. Like, this is cool. How can we use this in like a spot? So we had a really awesome creative director that really tried to think outside the box as far as like creative services and stuff like that. But then the recession hit, the great recession hit and he got laid off. A lot of other people got laid off and it was like, you know, things just kind of really dampened everything there. and. It was more about, it wasn't about like, how can we push this stuff and what cool things can we do? And it was more just like, how can we tread water and just like keep our heads above water? Because like, you're just afraid that you're gonna lose your freaking job the next day. So it's like, well, let's not stick our necks out too much. And the fact that like, we never rehired the, a creative man, a creative, uh, a creative director to replace the old one you're missing that big sounding board and that big like cheerleader, you know, in that in that department that we had there. And it just, you know, I had some friends that I'm like still really good friends with, um, like Mike Batista, who like ended up working there and he was in my wedding and everything. And so I met some really cool people. The problem was, is that every cool person that like I really vibed with would end up quitting and going to New York City because like, if you're in DC and you had the drive that I did, or you know Mike did, or you know a lot of my other friends, like you just bailed out, bailed out of DC and went to where there was way more opportunities in uh, New York City. And I was just like, I never wanted to do, like I didn't even like being in a big city like DC, and then DC is like way small compared to uh, New York. So I don't know. It, it was if I was a younger person, like I might have like had more drive to be like screw it but you know I just I don't know I got comfy and I was like I want to do freelance but I also don't want to do freelance and be in New York City there was like two or three years where I knew I wanted to jump to freelance and I really started focusing on my side hustle and I think it really it really hit me hard after my first NAB presentation because that was like mind like eye opening to like how big of a community there is in motion design and, like all the cool studios that you can work for and that's when i really started like seeing what was possible as far as a career outside of news like because no one else that was presenting or anyone i talked to was like working in news so you know i just got exposed to all the like all these studios and all these other artists and i was like man i want to do the type of work that these people do but i knew i didn't want to be in a studio either but so freelancing was like the one thing so you know through doing tutorials like that got me you know that got my name out there people would come to me fortunately enough and like hire me for work and stuff like that so at that point it became like, okay, doing tutorials is giving me exposure, showing my talent and what I can do. And this will hopefully help feed me uh, or help guide me into switching over to freelance because like my name's out there, people know me. I started doing freelance projects for studios and uh, people like that. And the tutorial thing was really a driving force behind actually getting jobs. So it was very hard though, to kind of go out on your own though, because it was pretty cushy job. Like I, but it was also bad because I wasn't challenged, but it was also really easy. Um, like I could on the DL, like do freelance at work <laughs> sometimes. Cause it was really dead. Um, but I was just really, but at the same time, like I had a lot of free time. I learned a lot of stuff, but at the same time, it's like just sitting in a room learning stuff all day doesn't matter if you're not like actually practicing those skills and getting out there, you know. So went to freelance. I landed like a four month gig. So I was like, all right, well, that's enough like to get me 
get the ball rolling hopefully and kind of like just went on from there. But all throughout, you know, I was still doing the tutorials, you know, through doing all these events, going to NABs and just meeting all these people and then meeting other people that also just did like a little bit of freelance work, but mostly did training. I was like, well, that sounds cool because clients are sometimes big pains in the butt. <laughs> and like, if I could just do training and then like do client work on the side where I'm not like beholden to client projects, like really bad clients sometimes where you're just like, well, this is gonna suck, but I need the money. And like I wanted to have the tutorial side or the, the teaching side give me more flexibility on the client side of things to the point where I just got to the point where I did a a uh, course for School of Motion. You know, I've been talking with Joey Corman who runs School of Motion for years and he always reached out to me like, hey, I think we're thinking about doing C4D, a C4D course and he's like, you're the first on my list, are you interested? And I'm like, oh crap, like that'd be amazing. Like, cause for the longest time I never really made money off of my training. Like it was just YouTube royalties or whatever the heck. Like no one really paid me to make a course and so that ended up working out. And then through doing that course, it was like one of the hardest things I've ever done, but it was also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done as well, to the point where like going through that course, seeing the reception, seeing people put down as much money as they did to like <laughs> listen to me teach this stuff, which was crazy. But that totally switched my mind to like, you know what, like I would, I'll work on a, Washington Capitals project and like, it'll play on the Jumbotron and that's super cool. That's a super cool feeling. But like for me, what I discovered was like, there is no replacing the feeling of, you know, traveling to Warsaw or something like that. And someone coming up to you and saying like, I took your course and it totally changed my life. I got a job because of it. Like, the, like that feeling that I get from that is way better than like, oh, I animated a NHL logo, you know? So at that point it was like, okay, this is what I wanna do. You know, help people realize their goals and like, just because, you know, my whole thing is like, it shouldn't be hard, it should be fun. And I try to make learning fun and approachable because I was in the same spot that all these other people that thought Cinema 4D was too hard and think any learning anything new is too hard, but you know what, I did it and everyone else can. And so when I hear that people, you know, push past that and I help them in some way to do that, like that's huge to me. Yeah. And that was what led me to working full-time at School of Motion now with Jean. <laughs> Transitioning like into photography and talking about the comparisons of 3D and photography. EJ, what do you think some of those comparisons are? What things transition over? And is it easy for a photographer to just jump into Cinema 4D and, and learn that or start learning 3D? Yeah, I mean, I think there's like a huge uh, influence. I mean, every lighting concept in 3D, every composition concept in 3D, every way you can animate a camera in 3D is all based on principles and fundamentals of like, you know, real world photography, Hollywood concepts, like Hollywood film concepts, stuff like that. Like what are the different camera moves? What are the different ways you can edit, different transitions, uh, how you compose a shot? And then how do you light a subject? It's all stuff from like studio photography, you know? And it's something that like, I wish I made the connection to like, well, number one, I didn't know I was gonna get in a 3D when I was in college, but like I did a photography class. I did a couple of them. I was like, how does this even apply to what I wanna do? And I was so, so dumb because it's like, well, how you compose a shot is all about design and composition and uh, contrast. And like, you can put all your design principles and use them as a photographer. And I think some people just have a knack for that. Like they just have a really good eye for composition. Like my wife took like one photography class. She's a teacher. She's like, she was a psychology major. And like, I'm jealous of her natural ability to just compose a shot because she just does it. And I have to think about all that stuff a lot more as far as like, okay, I know I need to crop this. I know I need to do the rule of thirds in like golden spiral. So like, I should compose it like, like I have to think of that a lot more. And my wife is just like, like doesn't even think about it. It's like, yep, that looks good. And she doesn't know why it looks good 
but she just knows it. But like, I know why it would look good, but I also have a tough time like actually doing the thing. So yeah, there's so much crossover between 3D and photography. One of my really good friends, David Ariev, he just did a course for us at School of Motion called Lights, Camera, Render, and he comes from a cinematography background. Like he shot uh, music videos for uh, Dave Matthews band. So like he learned all of those concepts like using actual cameras and man, does that knowledge show really obvious how well he knows how to compose a shot, animate a camera, light a subject. It's all these things where it's like, if you're a really good photographer, like you know a lot more about doing things in 3D, making pretty things in 3D than a lot of 3D artists do <laughs> at this point, because you could be like me and be totally oblivious to all those concepts that really build the backbone of fundamentals in 3D, not know them at all, and just be trying to, you know, scramble and try to cobble things together. Um, but if you're informed and you know how to use a camera in real life, how to compose a shot, how to do depth of field, like all that translates. Like if you can tell a story with the camera now, like you can do it in 3D. I think the only hardest thing now is just like, you know, there is a learning curve with 3D for sure. Uh, there's a lot of tutorials out there though, uh, these days, so it's really easy to pick up. And there's so many like resources too. Like if you want to light a model of a Roman bust, like a sculpture or something like that to practice like composition and lighting. Like you can download those things for free. You bring them into Cinema 4D or whatever app and you, you rotate lights around, you place lights and it's basically like, like I got my lighting set up in my office right here and it's like, oh, like I wish this was like in reality, this was as easy as Cinema 4D where it's like, I'll just pick this light up and move it over there and rotate it around and increase the brightness and I can do it all from just sitting in my chair. So I think if anything, working in 3D gives you a lot more flexibility to really flex and be creative with your photography skills because there's a fraction of the setup and you don't have to buy all the equipment either, you know? You don't have to buy a fancy camera. Uh, you just might have to buy a fancy renderer, maybe 3D renderer to make it look nice, but uh, all that stuff translates for sure. Yeah, that's super awesome. And it's actually funny, the way that you talked about um, being able to like move lights without mo leaving your chair and stuff. I've had this dream in my mind of hooking up all the gear I could possibly need on servos and gears and stuff and be able to really move lights in real time, like have a dedicated studio rig for that, it'd be insane. But off of that, uh, I wanted to ask like, are there ways that people can fuse 3D workflows and photography so that if you're coming from a photography background and say like right now there's you know the pandemic going on still and hopefully we're kind of at the tail end of it but it may be still a great time for people to pick up a new skill of learning 3D whereas like maybe they can't go to a shoot to do product photography but maybe they could get 3D models of those products and do it in digital form and make it photo real like what's the reality and what's What's the point of entry? How easily could someone who does photography get into that and make money? Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest way because I mean, 3D gets really deep and you know, I've been using it for you know over 10 years now and there's still so much I have to learn about, you know, texturing and unwrapping models and da -da -da, all that kind of like really nitty gritty stuff that, you know, learning 3D in itself is a task, but like then also learning how to animate and uh, just learning all the aspects of 3D is, is really hard, but the way of the less resistance to get into 3D is like, yeah, product photography. You do product photography. Like I was just saying before, like there's all these websites you can get free uh, 3D models. Um, Megascans is one that was developed by, uh, so Epic Games uh, is owned by, uh, makes Unreal, which is a, uh, like a, virtual like it's it's crazy it does like everything like you can create video games with it you can make motion graphics with it you can do editing in it you can do vr ar all kinds of stuff but uh they actually have they have like a whole library of like photo real assets so like a rock so you can like download a rock or a log you can i'm sure there's websites out there with like you know fake product a uh, photographer like a can or shampoo bottle, whatever it is, like, or a car even, you can download a car. If you wanna do car photography, like download the car, bring it into Cinema 4D or whatever app you wanna use. Blender is an app that's totally free 
It's not as easy to use as Cinema 4D, but it is free. Um, and you can bring that into that app and basically just like move it around and then just start making lights and lighting with it. And I think if you know how a light works in real life, like it, it's totally physically based lights in 3D as well. So you have and like your cameras work exactly the same. Like you have your aperture, focal length, you can control the amount of depth of field, apply LUTs and filters and stuff. You can render it out, you can bring it into Photoshop and do all those adjustments, the color correction that photographers would normally do. But yeah, the great thing about it is, is that you don't have to invest in the equipment. And there's like so many crazy things of like, oh yeah, in 3D, you can totally do what you do in like real life where if you have, you can light a subject with like a single light and have a bounce card and like have the bounce light illuminate some of the, like act as some of the fill. And it's like all those concepts translate to 3D and it's all these realizations of like, oh yeah, in 3D, you can just make a like 3D plane and make it white and because of the way everything's calculated in 3D, it acts as a bounce card. I was doing a lot of research for uh, this cinemato 3D cinematography class at School of Motion, and I was going through and I was like, the, the instructor, David, I was like, David, did you know that like you could just do that? And it actually looks pretty good. He's like, yeah, I've never thought it, like he just throws like 15 lights to light a subject because if you want just a tiny, tiny light to highlight just a little element here, like you can do it and you don't have to own 15 lights. So I think just the act of downloading a free model, hopefully the textures are okay and everything looks good. And then just cr like composing your shot, using your camera, using your rule of thirds, all that stuff. And then just lighting it is like, would be so fun for a photographer that's never done it before because like, John was saying like he wishes he had these servos and like you know just drones flying all around carrying lights and like that's basically it in 3D like you could do anything you want to do you can have 50 lights and you don't have to like go bankrupt <laughs> is, is there a simple way because I know texturing in 3D can be a little bit complicated but from a photographer standpoint say they wanted to make money doing product photography but they don't have all the gear and they can't go out and buy it right now and they don't want to but could they potentially like scan textures of the actual products someone sends them or take pictures of them and implement them fairly easily in 3D? Or is that like a big learning curve that they would have to overcome if they wanted to do customized textures? So it's funny, at School of Motion, we just did, we're, uh, we're gonna release a photogrammetry tutorial. Uh, and the tutorial, I uh, just looked at it a few days ago. Basically the, the artist was showing how you could use like a fancy Sony camera and download this software. And basically all you have to do is like take all these photos of all the angles of your subject. Basically he was doing a, he's creating a model of a shoe. So the shoe is just on this pole outside. He's got the shoe on top and he's taking photos all over underneath above. And the software stitches all that stuff together, creates this 3D mesh and the textures are all there. And you could also do this with an iPhone too. Now there's definitely detail loss with the iPhone, but it still looks really good. I, I've never done it myself, but that's definitely something that uh, someone who's in photography can easily do. Just use the camera they already own. That's probably really, really good. Take photos, scan that asset, bring it into like whatever software they wanna use. Like I think the, uh, the artists in this uh, video tutorial that's going on School Motion. He's using Cinema 4D. I'm sure you could use Blender too if you want. And uh, there's a little bit of like tweaking with textures and stuff like that. But honestly, learning textures is not that hard. Like if you just want to learn 3D to do to do product photography, there are so many aspects of 3D that you don't need to deal with, you know, like if you can just bring in a model, light it, and maybe you hire someone to texture it, or maybe the client you're working with already knows how to do this kind of stuff and they scan it for you. So like another artist already does all that hard work and you just light it and texture it. Uh, like I know artists that just solely like, there's a guy I know that just models Nike shoes. He doesn't know really how to 
you know, texture too much or light that well, but he's really good at modeling. So that's definitely a, a, a route for a photographer to get into 3D for sure. And 3D is getting so easy these days. Like I know Adobe Dimensions, I think is the app that like basically they have all these assets on their Adobe stock uh, site that you can bring in. And it's really easy to like, if you have a client that gives you a logo and it's an Illustrator file or a Photoshop file, you drag and drop that file on like the bottle or whatever product you're, you have and it just maps on there perfectly. Dimensions is definitely something I think photographers should look into because it's just so easy to bring in models and it's very intuitive as far as just exposing the aspects of 3D that a product a photographer would need. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're an editor and you use Mogerts or whatever, so you get to take advantage of like After Effects capabilities, but you don't have to go into After Effects and you're only exposed to the settings you need. I think Adobe Dimensions is like that. I've not used Dimensions before, but that's basically the gist of like what Adobe is doing there is, you know, making product photography very, very easy and simple for a photographer that really can lock in some lighting looks and uh, composing shots and stuff like that. That's some really good advice for people to get started if they're working in photography right now and they can't meet up with clients or anything. That's that's some great advice for them to get started in the 3D world with not overloading their brain and learning Cinema 4D and everything. So <laughs> yeah, totally. No, yeah, Cinema 4D. I mean, it's it's easy enough to get into, but there's a lot of things that you know, like if you want to use a third party renderer, like that's a whole another can of worms to like. And basically, what a third party render is, is like a, a renderer that renders photo real. So without it, if you just use like for Cinema 4D, for example, if you just use the built in renderers, there's a lot of settings to dial in to make it look photo real. Like you actually have to, you know, turn on the physically accurate light fall off. Otherwise you would have like a, a light that doesn't have realistic fall off and all that kind of stuff. So even renderers and software is getting better at this where there's less and less work for the artist to do to make a light act like a light and for a scene to, you know, have the realistic bounce light calculated and all that kind of stuff and do it really, really fast. Um, Blender has built in renderers that can kind of do it, but Blender's more of like, a, and this is a thing with different renderers, like some are way better for photo reel, some are way better for like game stuff. So yeah, I don't know blender if they do a lot of photo reel but like unreal uh by epic like that's free as well but that's like do you like to learn technical things you know because it's not it's definitely a steep learning curve there but they can do really photo reel stuff and you can like if you want to make a landscape there's a brush where you can just paint on plants onto like a surface and it's really crazy but yeah hopefully all this stuff gets way way easier for uh, for anyone who wants to do it, make it made more, way more accessible. A thought that came to my mind when I was listening to that was like, as a photographer, like you can use the skills you've already learned about composition and lighting and move into 3D and not necessarily move away from photography, but use them together. And that kind of puts you ahead of, you know, 90% of the people who just want to jump into 3D because they're, you know, stuck at home. They've never used a camera before. But, um, you know, that is definitely something you could do to expand on your offerings to clients. And especially now, completely digitally, you could recreate almost anything you wanted in 3D. You just got to put the time in and learn it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's actually, John, that's a really good point because, you know, I have a course for beginners learning Cinema 4D at School of Motion. And I have a lot of people making stuff off of tutorials on my YouTube channel and stuff like that. And the number one thing that people working in 3D are not great at is lighting, like it's lighting and composition. Like all of those photography skills, those are the biggest weaknesses for motion designers trying to get into 3D because like if you're, if you think about it, if you're a 2D animator, you don't have to worry about lighting at all. You don't have to worry about textures. Um, you don't have to really worry about cameras and focal lengths because you're just dealing with a flat 
uh, canvas, right? So it's not like, I mean, sure, if you're a painter and you want to make it realistic, you have to paint in all the details, but a 2D artist, like they don't really have to do that kind of stuff. But when you go into 3D, and that was the main thing for me was like, I didn't know about lights and cameras and how to use them. So like all of my, all of my stuff looked like really shiny and not realistic and like the lighting was bad. And um, I think, you know, renders will just look very muddy. Um, it's almost like if you don't know how to light as a product photographer and you have three lights and the person doesn't know anything about cameras and lights and you're like, hey, light this product, like that's basically what you have in 3D where you have all these 3D, or you have all these like animators and motion designers who just don't know what to do with lights and cameras. So yeah, like photographers, like I'm jealous of people that come from that cinematography background, like David Ariev, because he's got that part figured out and everything else like is the technical stuff, which I think the technical stuff is way easier to learn than cinematography and composition and design and lighting. Like those things are hard because there's not one solution to it. But the technical problem, it's like, does it work or does it not work, you know? Yeah, and I'll just keep going because that <laughs> brings me to another thing. Sorry to steal your thunder, Kyle, but I was just thinking like, it, it's probably almost easier to learn taste with photography because it's real, it's tactile, you've got your stuff, you've got a subject, you, you can walk around, you can move the lights, and you physically know what's happening and that translates into the computer a little easier because I, I used to be into 3D before I got into photography, I was messing around with it and I look at my old renders and they're just awful and I gave up on lighting, I just went with flat, flat textures and stuff. But now if I were to get back into it, I feel like it'd be a lot easier, but actually learning taste I feel like is easier uh, when in a physical form than on, on a computer because you're kind of forced and limited by what you can achieve and taste is a hard thing to learn. It's something you continually learn to get better at as you get older and more mature and you know, you'll know you never arrive at a place where you're like satisfied with your work because of the taste aspect. But eh, that's just a side note from my mind. Well, I mean, no, that's what I, that goes back to what I said about my wife who just like, gets a camera, takes a photo, it doesn't even think about it. And I'm like, that's really good. Did you, like, I like how you had this. And she's like, oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> All right, Kyle, back to you. <laughs> yeah, as just coming into this as a photographer, not really experiencing too much of the 3D world or working in that, um, what's the biggest piece of advice that you can give other photographers that haven't done this um, so they can just jump in and be successful with it? Yeah, so I think like anyone that wants to learn 3D, like 3D is a massive thing in itself. And I think the thing that will help someone the most, like a photographer, someone that's like never used it before, never even done any animation. So there's not even that uh, kind of gap to bridge. I would think the main thing is like, what do you want to do with it? Like, what are the goals that you want to do? Like, what style of work do you want to make? Because if you go in and you open up a new application and you know exactly what you want to do and what's what exactly you want to learn, then you can look that up and you have this narrowed focus versus like, I don't know, I'm in 3D, what do I do? It's kind of like if you're in Photoshop and you have a blank canvas and you're just like, what should I do? Uh, what do I want to learn here? Like just figuring out those things uh, really helps because it's hard. It's not going to be super easy to learn in 3D. It's a whole nother thing. But if you narrow the focus and it's something you really enjoy and you're passionate about, that's going to help motivate you to get past all of the roadblocks and things that I think will ultimately come. You have to be realistic, set realistic goals. Maybe the thing is like, I'm just gonna learn how I can bring in a model and I'm gonna learn how to use lights and that's it. And that's an easy win. Get that confidence, get that motivation, do these. Because when you hit those breakthroughs, like it's crazy. It's like this adrenaline rush and it just makes you wanna learn more and more and more and more. But it has to be, it has to relate to what you enjoy doing or you're just gonna fall off you know so good i need to i need to take some of that advice i always i have my hands 
dipped into so many different things and I tend to like focus really hard on one thing for a couple of years and then just move on to the next thing and burn out. And I never really get to the point of wanting to go back to something I've burned out on. So I don't want that to happen with photography and I wanna be able to like use that moving forward to make my work more unique and more, I guess, diverse, but yeah. Yeah, cause I mean, the I, I always think the biggest the hardest thing to learn is, yeah, the cinematography aspects, but it's also the creative aspect. Like, if you come in with a really clever idea, like there's people that don't know 3D as well as I do, and they're just making incredible things, you know? So it's not about, it's not about what the tool can do for you, it's what you can do with the tool, you know? It's not like you have to learn every single thing about a camera to be able to make beautiful photography, you know? So it's the same kind of thing, where you don't need to know all the things about 3D to make awesome things in 3D. So like, and that's where narrowing the focus really helps, helps get you to whatever you wanna make. Yeah. Speaking of narrow focuses, EJ, right now, if you had to pick, if you had to pick one, what would be your top favorite beer currently? Oh man. I can choose it. Can I choose a brewery? Sure. Choose a brewery and then choose like your top pick in that brewery. Okay. All right. So the brewery's in right outside of Breckenridge, which is like an hour away from where I live in Denver. It's called Outer Range. And uh, they have like some of the best hazy IPAs ever. And it's just a great place to go to after you're like exhausted from snowboarding. Um, and it's got an awesome view of the mountains. And if I were to choose one beer from there, Man, it's so tough. Like every beer I have there is like, oh my God, this is my favorite. They have a beer called Forestry and it basically tastes like you're drinking a liquid like pine tree. <laughs> it's like super dank and piney and hoppy and I love it. It's like a milkshake. It's great. I almost forgot to even mention anything about beer. So that was, <laughs> that was good on you for asking that. Drink enough and you'll have blurred focus. I feel like that's a sin for me to not mention beer with EJ on this, especially with how much we both love beer. <laughs> so true. Awesome. Well, uh, I want to thank you, EJ, personally for coming and, and joining us for our, our little bitty tiny channel currently it really means a lot to us that you'd come on and share your advice for our audience as we grow together, Kyle and I, as creatives and our audience grows with us. So your insights like totally amazing and completely like just invaluable for i'm sure everyone who's watching that's awesome i'm happy to happy to be on whenever and i hope you just don't get a lot of people unsubscribing after you post this one <laughs> smash that subscribe button ring the bell <laughs> do all the things do all the things So something that we do every episode is we come up with a photo challenge for everybody in the community to get involved with and post on Instagram. So we ask you to come up with a photo challenge and what what's your photo challenge for our viewers? Yeah, so I think one that could be really cool. My dog just had his 15th birthday, he's a little pug. And so I've been taking a lot of photos of him. Uh, and I also, funny story. Went to I get bird seed because we have like bird feeders outside and it's really cold. So I'm like, man, I gotta make sure these birds got enough to eat. So got a bunch of bird seed and stuff. They had a bird show, like radio show recording in this bird seed store. And I was like the youngest person there. I felt really weird. But basically I love seeing all the birds in my backyard and like I'll check that I'll take photos and I'll take photos of my pug. And so I thought a really good one because we're all stuck at home anyways. Maybe people have bird feeders in their backyard. Let's do some animal photography, whether it be like wildlife or your pet. Um, or maybe it's maybe if you don't have pets or there's no animals, uh, maybe just take photos of beers. I don't know. Or fruit with faces, like put little googly eyes on fruit, uh, make them into dogs. I don't know. Or go to the zoo. Yeah, I don't know. I think zoos should, most zoos are open right now. I can just, I mean, it's, it's a, three degrees here, but I mean, you could bundle up. The zoo's probably gonna be uh, not having a lot of people there. So you might be able to just, you know, pop a squat and take a lot of photos.
We're actually gonna change it up this time and we're gonna put our edit, our full editing process and how we capture that photo on Instagram. So be sure to head over to our Instagram page at a different perspective.tv to go check out that shooting process and our edit behind the photo. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this special episode of A Different Perspective. Be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell icon so that you're notified when the next episode comes out and you can keep up to date on all of our current challenges. And if you are going to submit a photo, make sure to hashtag at a different perspective TV on Instagram so that we can find it and feature it on the next episode. Thanks again for watching this episode. We hope you were as inspired as we were by this conversation with EJ and we will see you in the next episode.